All right, hello everybody. Uh, this is gonna be a fascinating panel. Uh, I wanna set the context for you guys real quick though. So I want everybody to introduce themselves uh, as quickly as we can, and then we're gonna get to questions. So Zudi, go ahead. Um, my name is Zudi Jaster. It's a pleasure to be here. I run an American Islamic Forum for Democracy. Our organization was founded in 2003 under the premise that uh, terrorism is simply a symptom of a larger global problem of political Islam or the Islamic State ideology. ISIS didn't exist at the time. We are countering any idea of the Islamic Republics, of Iran, Saudi Arabia, any Sharia-based state, if you will, we believe is the root cause of terror. We believe Islam is in that time of history in which reformation needs to happen against modernity. So our narrative is to push media to address not symptoms, but root cause ideologies that we believe is Islamism. And we do that through a positive identity of secular identity as citizens through a, 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 a government blind to religion, per se. All right. So we will have disagreements on this panel. Bjorn. Uh, so, hi, I'm Bjorn, and thank you all for coming. Um, I work with the Khalifa Ilar Institute, which was started last year, building on a larger body of work, among others, with the Institute of Strategic Dialogue. Um, we focus on countering extremism and countering terrorism and general peace building, um, working off of a platform of the understanding of uh, extremism as uh, the denial of diversity in some form or another. Uh, that builds on my experience of meeting with a ton of former extremists, people who used to be in various extremist movements and learning from them about how they became extremists and how they stopped being extremists. Um, which was prompted by myself almost being killed by a far-right extremist in Norway back in 2011. Very, very happy to be here. Sasha Havlicek. I run the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, which I helped set up in 2006. Since then, we've been working to counter extremism across the ideological spectrum, from far-right to Islamist, increasingly around the world. We've developed programs that are innovations in dealing with this problem, working with many, many partners. As we've seen the problem migrate online, since we're here at the Internet Forum, I should say we do more and more work, of course, with the Internet companies, with technology and communication partners to look at how we can push back the radicalization challenge online. All right, great. Now, um, the point of this is to discuss terrorism within the context of the media and the narratives. So I know that some of our panelists uh, are, are going to think that Islam is not necessarily the main form of ter uh, terrorism or where it comes from in the U.S. particularly. And Zudi, you're in the U.S. Um, what's your take on that? Is Islamic terrorism the number one issue with, uh, of, of terrorism in America or no? Well, I think it would be, you know, uh, disingenuous to say that it's the only form of terrorism. But I think in order to cure each form, you don't take terrorism, which is a symptom, all as one block. You cure each problem with its root cause. I'm a physician. I, treat I don't treat symptoms. I treat root causes, the disease and the cancer that causes Islamist-inspired extremism is Islamism. So violent Islamism, the precursor of that, is nonviolent Islamism, no different than Nonviolent anti-Semitism is a precursor of violent anti-Semitism. Violent homophobia is, a precur is precursed by nonviolent homophobia. So I can help you as a Muslim by countering Islamism. Terms like Islamophobia, I think, stifle the conversation. I think looking at Muslims as simply a minority in the American context, rather than having a unique responsibility in a laboratory of freedom to counter the root causes that exist in Iran and Saudi Arabia and Egypt where they can't do it. We had a massive opportunity, Jenk, in the Arab awakening that the United States, because of its ethnocentrism of looking at Muslims only through the lens of who we are as a checkbox for the left or the right in America rather than globally, where 1.6 billion Muslims are going through a disruption process, which I think forums like this should be leading, which is internet companies should be giving Muslims a handle and the respect, a tough love to counter our establishment that is the root cause. And in America, our dialogue, unfortunately, has been which party can really protect Muslims or the security issue rather than looking at the narrative globally. Okay, there's certainly a lot I disagree with about that, but I want to save that for a second and, and go to the question that we were addressing. So, Sasha, I know that you all study um, uh, how the media is handling terrorism and the, the issue of extremism in the U.S., Europe, and other parts of the world. 
So in the U.S., to the same question that I asked, is Islamic terrorism mm -hmm. actually the number one problem uh, in terms of terrorism? Well, it's interesting. In terms of terrorist attacks, successful terrorist attacks, since 9-11 in the U.S., 75, I'm sorry, 73% of those have been linked either to white supremacist groups, anti-government, anti-establishment groups, or neo-Nazi groups. Uh, but I should say, what we've learned working across different ideologies now for a decade is that um, the anatomy of extremist groups is much the same. It posits the superiority of an in-group over all other groups and uh, propagates an us and them narrative. Uh, first, potentially quite uh, non-violently and then, of course, progressively more and more violently all of those ideological streams, from fascism uh, to Islamist extremism, are a massive problem, and they share a lot in common. We learned that bringing together former extremists from across the ideological spectrum and starting to work with them, build a network, and understand with them, how do we start to unplug this problem? How do we both prevent and bring young people often out of these movements? So Bjorn, it sounded like what you were saying is that you're trying to study all the different forms of extremism and break down the root cause, which could arguably be the same as what Zu uh, Zudi's saying, um, but he's doing a subset of that. Is that right or wrong? Uh, and, and do you agree or disagree with his take on it? Well, I, I do to some extent agree with him, and I think he is working on one subset, and I think that's very helpful to, to address the issues of that one subset. But what I want to do is look at extremism as a whole and see what are the unifying factors behind these subsets of extremists. And so if you look at Islamism, yeah, behind Islamism there is Islam um, as an ideology. Behind the far-right extremism there's far-right ideology. Um, you can look at the ideologies, but what the unifying factors are is uh, things like people seeking some sort of belonging somewhere, some sense of purpose, some sort of wanting to change the world in the direction where they take care of who they see as part of their group or their tribe, and there's kind of that tribalism is, is a problem. And um, what Sasha said there is uh, um, it breaks down to us and them, it breaks down to who is the in the in group and who's in the out group. And so the way in which I've defined the problem essentially is by looking at diversity and saying that violent extremism is the violent denial of diversity, it's the violent denial of difference, of people having different opinions or a different way of life or a different religion or you know a different skin color than what you have. And so a violent extremist is someone who wants to exterminate the people who are different from them. And the antithesis to that is diversity. It's making people accepting of the fact that people are different and that we can live together peacefully and be different. But and so I work on uh, trying to widen <laughs> people's horizons and, uh, and uh, trying to make people feel comfortable enough with their own identities to not feel threatened by other people having a different identity than them. Okay, I, I'm going to go to Sudi next, but I just want to say that uh, I never thought about it that way. Uh, that it's not, like when you think about the 9-11 bombers, they weren't like, hey, Buddhists, Jews, you're all welcome, <laughs> right? Or Brevik or any of the guys who uh, are on the uh, right-wing extremists. They, they do not welcome diversity. That, that is a, a unifying factor, I have to honestly admit, after all the years, years that I had missed. So it's really interesting addition to the to the uh, dialogue but Zudi you wanted to jump in yeah I wanted to say that there you know just to simply elucidate one point which I think is really important is the conflation of extremism by fascist groups in the West white supremacist groups whatever they might be with Islamist extremism just because they use the same tactic which is to violently kill innocent people is I think very detrimental to treating the problem across the Muslim world the reason it's detrimental is it's ahistoric the West is living in a bastion of secular liberal democracies. Yes, they've reverted to fascism in the last century, and then after World War II, that went away. So I'm not saying that isn't something to pay attention to, which is hyper-nationalism. But to say Islamist extremism is just all the same thing is absurd because it, in a way, negates the harm of, hundreds of governments that are running hundreds of millions of people across the planet the theocracy in Iran, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, the Wahhabis of Saudi Arabia, the Ikhwan al in, 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 in Egypt, the Tunisian al-Nahda, the AKP in Turkey. These are huge Islamist movements 
we can choose to take on their precursors, which are the abuse of women, the hate of other faiths, the hate of moderate Muslims, apostates, blasphemy laws. And if you conflate that with simple hyper-nationalism in the West, because they use the same tactic, you are going to avoid and actually anesthetize Muslims to the solution that we need globally, which is the overthrow of the regimes. You can't solve ISIS. I'm from Syria. My family is from Syria. You can't solve ISIS with Assad in power. You need a democratization of Syria. No matter how ridiculous you think that thought is, you will never have terrorism go away. It'll continue a whack-a-mole program unless you democratize and secularize those societies. I, I think we agree, I though. I completely agree on your point about Assad. Absolutely impossible to proceed without that. But make no mistake, uh, extremists, neo-Nazi, uh, the, there's a wide spectrum now of far-right groupings that are connecting the dots and tactically allying. And their objective is the same. It is the overthrow of the system, of the democratic system. They may not be quite as successful at it at this point in time as many of these other groups you're talking about. But they are on the rise. In Europe, across Europe, we've seen this is an undercurrent that ebbs and flows depending on the time. But this is a major systemic challenge now for many, many societies. Let's not underestimate it. But the systems overthrow piece is what, uh, what I think we need to be clear about. These are, many, in many ways, the same beasts, though one is theocratic in its orientation and the other may not be. But the ideologies are very similar. And, and Zudi, there is another problem that arises from your line of thought, uh, which is, um, first of all, I, I think factually you're incorrect. Uh, you know, you, you talk about Islam needs reformation, and it's a standard talking point that I hear, uh, and, oh, it's 500 years behind. Well, no, uh, Islam was, uh, in many respects, in earlier empires ahead of Europe. Mm -hmm. So it's not a simple matter of a timeline. And, you, and people make it seem like Christianity is hunky-dory and a wonderful reformation. Uh, the Holocaust was, what, 70 years ago? Yeah. Uh, it seems like Christianity was monstrous just 70 years ago, way worse than Islam has ever been, than any religion has ever been. Hitler. So if you took your point of view in 1942, you would say the Christians are the worst. The Christianists are the ones that are destroying the world. We must reform Christianity, which is so barbaric that it has just killed 13 million people. These Christians are the problem. Now, I say that as a prelude to, can you not see that when you say what you said, that people think, Oh, a lot of right-wingers especially. Oh, right, right. Muslims are the problem. Mo Muslims are backwards. And we must address Islam before anything else, especially given that three-quarters of the terrorism in America is actually right-wing terrorists. The, the stats you're using are very deceptive, which is you're saying three-quarters. You do the population ratios when Muslims are three, you know, barely one to two percent, and then you ratio that to the amount of terrorism. So are Muslims I would tell you, worse? I'm telling you that Muslims need to be not treated as children and infantilized, but rather treated as adults, which is that you have to expect of them not to view us in a narrative of we want to coddle Muslims and ignore the fact that in most of the mosques, women are, are separated, they're not on boards, they can't even be seen at the base of the mosque in the, in the, uh, in the main center of, pra of prayer worship. And then we, tr we ignore all of that because we want to use them in an identity politic for our partisan politics. And to say that Hitler and other fascist movements were Christianists, they weren't citing from Scripture. They weren't wearing robes yes, of were. the Church of England. That is literally and not true. Well, the, uh, he, Hitler it ignores, said, it ignores the Christ. Enlightenment and the... Th the 30 years war in which 8 million people died, that was against theocracy. America's foundation was against theocracy. Hitler's movement was a racial fascism that wasn't about theocracy. And I'm telling you now that if you're going to defeat Islamist-inspired terrorism, ISIS gets its ideas. The founding fathers of ISIS are the Saudis. The Wahhabi ideology, they've beheaded more people in Saudi Arabia than ISIS has in the last year. If you want to defeat that, we have to stop coddling governments like the Saudis, saying that they're reformists when in fact they are putting the nails in the coffin of most reformers like myself. We have a reform movement that has a declaration that's two pages. Why don't they have us, when you talk about diversity in the Muslim community, instead of putting the same old Islamist organizations up that say, oh, we are the victims and we are being criticized by Islamophobia. Islam is an idea. It doesn't have rights. Muslims have rights. 
Islamophobia is a term generated by these governments to prevent online media critique of Islam and its need to reform. So the narrative you're giving actually empowers the regime's PR mechanisms through media to, to make you afraid to criticize Islam because Muslims in America would be the victims of your narrative. And that is absurd. We're adults. We can, ta we can take care of ourselves. And when you're talking about Muslims as diverse, instead of putting an Egyptian, a Pakistani, and a Syrian as a diversity, how about you put a liberal Muslim, conservative, a gay Muslim, a, a, a socialist okay. Muslim as diversity, which you're not seeing right now? Yeah. Uh, well, if you watch our show, you would know that we attack uh, Saudi Arabia, the government of Iran, uh, oftentimes criticized very harshly Turkey, etc., for the fundamentalist attack that they're taking. You can criticize Islam. I'm, uh, by the way, I left Islam, so you might think that perhaps I'm the Muslim and, and he's the atheist. I'm actually the atheist, he's the Muslim. So you should be uh, working with us rather no, than... No, because Zudi, what you're doing is stigmatizing 1.6 billion people. And I, I, I might not be among well, them, you but I care about them. You're stigmatizing them by you're saying the Islamists speak for us. They don't. No, by no, ignoring no I'm not the saying that. You're issue. saying okay, that. It's such anyway, a tired, okay, Sasha, I got to come to you. Hold on one second. It's a conversation yeah, because we should all be fighting together. Ultimately, we're looking at fighting for a pluralist environment which enables the freedom of every individual. And so this slinging match isn't getting us there. And we have to start to now work from upstream to downstream, across communities. We all have tendencies towards fascistoid ideologies. They are the same. They seek the same thing. Islamist so are you saying not, that Islam is worse, uniquely worse than every other fascist in, ideology? Islam, Islam is similar to where Christianity was in 1530s and the no, early 16th 70 century. 70 years ago, they killed more people than any people in the history of the that planet. Is, that you is are purposely completely blind because you are trying to smear is Muslims. Look, I was try, I, we I'm had trying a great to smear Muslims. Yes, that's exactly what you're doing. A fasting, say that praying, Quran reading, every Muslim group, is smearing Muslims. It is Muslim. so obviously a historic... The, and, and this goes the, the king point. of Saudi Arabia would be very happy with what you're saying right now. Uh, the king of Saudi Arabia hates me. Fundamentalist sure. Muslims have threatened to murder me. As long as you say okay. Muslims are victims, then you'll love What I find fascinating okay. though, is that your solution to the problem of Syria is the democratization of Syria. What you're working for is freedom of expression, and okay. that has a mean for okay. you know, democratization of the world. And so democracy and freedom of expression, and thus also diversity of ideas, is what you both are promoting as the solutions to the problem. And that is the solution to the problem. Absolutely. Whether you call the ideology that you're fighting against Islamism, or whether it's far-right fascism, or whether it's Islamist fascism, or whatever kind of extreme ideology it is. So eventually, like if, we are go you, coming back. I, I hear to you, that. brother. But if he was fighting against just extremism, then I'd be 100 percent with him. But at every turn, and we had a great conversation beforehand. But you come out here, and at every turn, you're like, Muslims are worse. Muslims are worse. Muslims are worse. And that's preposterous, not true, and it smears 1.6 billion people. And I'm not going to stand for it. it now, it, the, the, the point of this it doesn't is smear media. them. That yeah, smear is, that is that nonsense. You keep saying Muslims it's are worse. trying to wake them up to, to the it's responsibility. We Muslims in the West that they're worse? Hold on a second. That is completely unfair. We are living in an anesthesia where your, your benign negligence of Muslim responsibility to counter the theocrats at the pulpits of every mosque in America and in the West and just say, oh, forget the anti-Semitism, the homophobia. Who the hell said in the that? I that's fight what, against that every that's day. That's what you're saying by saying well, that not, that's not a root cause. You're just saying every Muslim is like that. All right, Sasha, the Nonsense. point of this panel is media narratives <laughs> around terrorism. And Zudi claims that in the West, Muslims are coddled that they are especially protected. Absolutely. When you turn on television, do Muslims look coddled to you? Let, uh, yes. So let's look forward. I, I think Bjorn and I are going to take over moderating now. Okay. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> um, so looking, uh, looking at the media, it's interesting because, of course, these kinds of conversations are widely popularized and polarizing, and we see this. Interesting, actually, because much of the work that we do on counterterrorism looks at the online space as the focal point of where this is all happening, radicalization, recruitment, etc. But actually, mainstream media plays an unbelievably important role in terms of the, the meta-narratives, how people understand their own identity. It is absolutely clear that young Muslims waking up to a post-9-11 media environment are going to be asking questions about their identity, and it is not an easy environment. Number one, that doesn't mean that one needs 
to pander or coddle those uh, people that would push extremist views. On the contrary, we need to be engaging people. We need to be engaging the people that are most likely to be able to fight those ideologies, which is people within their own communities. Young people, by the way, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. It isn't also uh, grand chiefs sitting, looking down at their people, saying, you must do this, you must do that. These kids are online searching for whatever, shake Google, uh, coined, uh, this, is, this is a phrase coined by Farah Pandit sitting in front of me, so I'm, I'm channeling her. But the, but the point is that we need to start to build the kinds of credible movements within communities to fight against the, the onslaught of propaganda. Mainstream media, amazingly, actually, when you look at ISIS's playbook on propaganda, they're very clear about the weaponization of mainstream Western media as part of that playbook. So they know that the way in which we report on these things is a fantastic way to glorify their ends. And so we do fall into the trap in many ways of, of, of glorifying, and there is an imbalance in the way that we report uh, on, on the different types of extremism that we see at play. So Bjorn, uh, on the glorification, it's a tough situation for the media to be in. Uh, I, I think in some ways, by creating the imbalance of overhyping every Muslim attack and underhyping this three quarters of right wing terrorist attacks. By the way, I don't know if you guys know this, there was an assassination attempt on Donald Trump. So it didn't just happen, so don't panic. It happened during the campaign. And it was by an undocumented immigrant. Yet almost none of you have probably heard about it. Uh, certainly in the audience, almost no one's heard about it. Why? It was a white British guy. So it was no big deal and the press didn't talk about it. If that guy's name was Zudi's name, mm. everyone would have talked about it forever, and you all know it. It doesn't matter where you are in the political spectrum. So, but on the other hand, Bjorn, what are you supposed to do? Not talk about uh, these huge terrorist attacks like the one that just happened in New York? So how do you solve that? Well, I think you need to talk about it in a more nuanced way, and I think you need to cover every terrorist attack kind of equally and equalizing them. I mean, in Sweden, in February, we had three bombs planted around in the city of Gutenberg, and they happen to be targeting refugee centers and migration centers. Um, and they blew up a guy, uh, and they were planted by the far right, the Nordic Resistance Force. Um, later in the year, a guy drove into a crowd of people, uh, not once but twice. You guys heard about like one guy who drove into a crowd of people in Stockholm. This other guy drove into a crowd in Stockholm a couple of weeks earlier. His car was painted with swastikas. Like no one heard about that one. Um, and people go hurt, you know, it's uh, it's the same kind of thing, and it's underreported because it happens to be a white guy. Now, like, one of the points I want to make as well is that um, Joseph Goebbels was a fairly leading Nazi, but one of the things he said was, if you tell something enough times, it becomes the truth. And if you keep telling Islamists, um, or, well, if you keep telling Muslims that they are Islamists, that they are terrorists, that they are evil, then that eventually becomes something that people who identify as Muslims will identify with. And so that's a push factor that pushes people into Islamist extremism who are of Muslim origin. And we're seeing that happening across the West where uh, we see people who don't feel that they are belonging, that they are fitting into Western society because they are being perceived by the rest of their society as Muslims who are being pushed into then extremist communities. And then on the other hand, we have the white majority who is seeing Muslims as a credible threat because they are getting overhyped to some extent while not realizing that the problem is not which ideology you believe in, but that you believe in killing people and hurting people who are different from you, who believe in different things from you, or who simply looks different. But the media I will imbalance, sorry, isn't just uh, in terms of the different types of extremism. We in the West only really report on attacks in the West even by Islamists. So the Paris attack in 2015, for instance, got, I think, 17 times the coverage that the, the attack in Beirut uh, got the day before that. I mean, we, we just don't look at it in a broader context, which also feeds this idea of the clash of civilizations. This is just happening to us and them. And the, the, so we don't, we don't shape that. Le Monde has taken an interesting approach to this, the French newspaper. They have stopped... Um, publishing photos of terrorists and their names. <laughs> and of course they report on the attack. 
And then, and then others have looked to focus on the victims and name them and give them their place in this space. So I think there are ways in which one can report in more innovative ways on these attacks without glorifying. Yeah, uh, um, at the Young Turks, we, uh, after the first day, we try really hard not to show the picture or name either the terrorists or the mass shooters. Because I agree with Bjorn, I think they're looking for glory in all the wrong ways and we don't want to give them that glory. Yeah. But Zudi, I, I wanted to let you jump in and also ask you following these, um, so do you think that the mainstream media in the US where you're from is handling it appropriately, that they should be focusing more on the Muslim attacks or maybe even more so than they already are? Well, again, I, I don't know if I'd compare them. I think each one has issues, whether it's on the the the, the r radical psychopaths that do what they do at the ch church recently, et cetera. That needs to be addressed as a psychiatric issue that we're not treating mental health well. But when it comes to Muslim uh, radicals or Islamist militants, if you will, I would ask the media, and the reason I've taken the time to come from Arizona to this meeting is – the Middle East transformed itself. Now it's gone steps backwards, but it was for the first time. My grandfather was in and out of jail under the Ba'athists. My parents escaped Syria. 2011 was a watershed moment, a, a tipping point in, in history over the past hundreds of years that was an opportunity to finally defeat the root causes. It was changed by Google, Twitter, YouTube. Syria was the YouTube revolution that now we've sort of turned a blind eye to. We're not looking to the use of chemical weapons, etc. And to mistake the deep, direct, covalent connection between those dictatorships, the Arab awakening, and the means for disruption, I would tell you that Muslim communities would benefit from disruption. Whatever it takes to disrupt us, the narrative, because Muslims are three or four million Muslims in America, the, the minorities living in the West, we have a laboratory to do things that needs this networking to be done in order to bypass the current establishment power structures that are ossified and fossilized in the 8th and 9th century. They're not advancing. And in order to do that and have that discussion, it has to be had in the media. The media has to have that, social media. Traditional media is not having it because left and right, the left says it's all a psychiatric issue. The right says, well, Islam is the problem. In the middle is 90% of the, of the free world saying, where are you guys? Where's your diversity? And we need to have that conversation, and it has to start here in social media. But Zudi, it, it sounded like, but I want you to clarify, that you were saying that in the case of the mass shootings and the non-Muslim extremism, it's a mental health issue. But when it comes to Muslims, it's not a mental health issue. It's not. Uh, uh, okay. Al-Baghdadi, Osama bin Laden are not mentally ill people. These are fascist theocrats. So only the white people are mentally ill, but Muslims quit, mean to quit do using it me, Muslim. Quit using me as, an, as, a, as a lens through which to look at partisan politics. If you want to look at Christian radicalism, we can do that, but I'm not your expert for that. I am a Muslim reformer who believes that we are coming through a time that we need to defeat theocracy, no different than Jefferson, Madison, and the founding fathers did in the West. That's where Islam is today. And you are talking to me as if somehow I'm conflated with the U.S. Communist Party and others. I would be my antagonist, if you look at this discussion in the Middle East, the antagonist is the Muslim Brotherhood Party, political parties that are based in Islam. In the West, you don't have those type of political parties other than a few, yes, the KKK and others, but they are on the margins. In well, the Muslim have, community, have, it's in the you center. You have Front National, you have Donald Trump's But they're whatever, marginal. Is called, like, so the three quarters of power. terrorist attacks are marginal, but the one quarter is central. I got it. So uh, now, again, I want to go to uh, the issue of the media and these narratives. So... Sasha, how do you fight against radicalization, whether it's far-right extremism or Islamic extremism, but not perpetuate the narrative that those people are in those groups? And I think something that actually Zudi's tr struggling with in a sense, I don't know if he knows he's struggling with it, but how do I defeat Muslim fundamentalism, a goal that I completely agree with, without seeming to target Muslims? It's interesting because we've we've been looking at this from a far too narrow perspective for a very long time. People in the political space, social scientists, academics, think tankers, and actually we're missing a, a beat here. And that's why I'm so excited to be here. We're not understanding that the 
constituencies that are at risk of recruitment radicalization that are being bombarded on a day in day out basis by content, mainly online but offline too, um, that's seeking to recruit them into these extreme polls. Um, we, we haven't given them the tools to respond in any serious or scaled way. And, and that's what we're in the business of trying to do now. We desperately need the tools that you all have here, communication strategies and tools being used to sell you stuff, the social media marketing tactics that are, are selling us politicians every day and Coca-Cola. But we need young people who are credible within their own constituencies that have influ influencers within their own communities to have these sorts of tools. We need innovation in technology to come to bear on this issue. We haven't done that at scale yet. We've been excited because we've had an opportunity now to partner with the likes of Facebook and Google and Microsoft to look at new ways in which we enable credible voices at the front line of these issues within their own spaces to stand up and push back in a variety of different ways, which, of course, this is the other thing. There isn't one point at which you radicalize. There isn't one point at which you get moved in. You need different types of approaches and tactics and narratives depending on where you are in that. Again, marketing experts know that. They know how to segment their audience. So we're trying to apply some of that because from upstream to positive messaging through to direct interventions which we've led online, which have been incredibly successful in partnership with the likes of Facebook, um, we have tools and we have the modalities. What we haven't done yet is scale. So uh, look, one way I do it is just try to argue against religion, period, which I know is not politically correct. Uh, but I think it's poison overall. All of the religions, not just one of them. Uh, I think they're all, unfortunately, totally wrong. The texts are wrong. They lead to violence. And I think we have to change the culture. But most people are not going to adopt that stance. So, uh, Bjorn, I know you talked earlier, and I want you to share with everybody, about reverse engineering extremism. And then I don't know if you have time, but can you connect that to how the media can help to do that? Uh, so reverse engineering extremism is, is one of the things I do. And, like... A lot of that has to do with the figuring out what stories people believe in within extremist environments. Like, what do they believe to be the truth about themselves and what do they believe to be the truth about others? And we do that by analyzing how messaging works within extremist environments. And data analysis is a big part of that. And trying to figure out basically the dynamics of how information looks and how it's spread. And then we are using that to try to replicate that information in some sort of way. We're trying to create information that looks similar, that behaves similarly in cyberspace to the information that's spread by extremists, but our information is slightly at edge with what extremists are saying. Like we, we entered a far right space, for instance, with information that eventually led them to you know, helplines for people who wanted to de-radicalize and get out of far right movements. And these are things that can be done and that are done. And I think one interesting thing um, to kind of underline this whole thing is that you're self-identifying as a Muslim and uh, there's plenty of different ways of understanding Islam and trying to find nonviolent ways of understanding Islam and teaching those ways in those spaces where Islam is being understood as, vi as violent is one way of creating a different message and spreading a different message and different narrative about what Islam is to the people who self-identify as Muslim. And I think that is something that should be done to a much larger extent than what it is right now. And I think the media could help in that, both in creating better messages for very specific spaces, but also in creating a better, larger overall narrative of uh, who we are as the majority and how we should relate to our minorities and how we should speak to each other and how we should understand each other's cultures and religions. So uh, we're out of time. I want to do very specific thank yous here because Sasha has been working on fighting extremism for over a decade and, and helped Bjorn to get his group started. Bjorn not only survived Brevik's attack, but believes that uh, he should have the same human rights as everyone else's and has fought for that. That is a level of magnanimous behavior I cannot imagine. <laughs> and he was almost murdered by Brevik. And to f then to fight for his rights is amazing. And Zudi, to have the courage to come and, and disagree, and, and honestly, it's, you know, in a, in a situation where not everybody agrees with you, and to fight for your principles, even if we disagree, thank you f so much for doing that, thank and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you.